I'd like to read a verse, first of all, in uh, Proverbs 25, verse number 18. I'm sorry, verse number 28. It says, A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Or the King James says, He that has no rule over his own spirits like a city that is broken down without walls. And the last number of years, I would say that this is the type of people that we have been working with. People that have no control over their own spirit, and they're like cities that are broken down without walls. For the past 15 years, each winter, my wife and I, and we usually try and get one or two others to go with us. If it's not grandchildren, it's some others that we think could be blessed and be a help. We travel uh, in northern Canada, up into the Northwest Territories and into the Arctic. And um, there's about 50 communities that we have been to, a number of them we go back to a number of times over the years. So as a result, we get to know a, a few people in some, little, in some little measure. When I get to the community, we have a, a winter RV that we park in the town. And uh, I go door to door throughout the community and talk to people, give out Bible posters, DVDs, um, via magazines, and um, New Testaments or Bibles, whatever we feel that people can use it. They're very welcoming. Um, this past winter, we went, took 1,400 packages, went to homes, and in all the houses we went to, there was only three people that refused. And the, the odd thing was that the one man that refused i could look behind him on the wall and i could see our posters there from the other year that were still stuck up on the wall so um we do get familiar with a a few folks going to these communities um they are what they call winter roads they call them ice roads but the roads we go on are simply bulldoze with a bulldozer they go over the muskeg and they end up um, leaving a road for us that is extremely rough, but we managed to get to these communities. And the nice thing is that Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons never go, so we have pretty much a, a fairly warm welcome from the people. Um, ten years ago, we moved to Prince Albert in Saskatchewan, which is kind of two-thirds of the way north in the province. Um, they say it's a difficult city. Well, every place seems to me that it's difficult. There's no seemingly easy spots, but it is considered one of the five most dangerous cities in Canada. Uh, it's probably partly because there's four prisons in the city. There's only 35,000 people, but there's a maximum penitentiary. There's a uh, women's prison. There's a general population prison and there's a youth detention center. And my wife and I take the services quite often in the women's prison. They want us, we could go a lot more, but they want a couple. So a husband and wife, and it's very rare to find the husband and wife that will um, work in the prison. When we do go there, we know many of the people that um, we have met on the streets. So we know already a number of the people that are there. The city of Prince Albert, though it only has 35,000 people, it serves a, an area, a population of about 160,000, which is the people from the north that came down to Prince Albert, which is the, the nearest city. When we park the trailer on the street, we haven't been able to do that in the last, since this COVID thing. 
Um, presently, I just go out and talk to people that we know on the street. But when we park the trailer in the street, we give out coffee, cookies, sandwiches, Bible posters, DVDs, um, tracks, via magazines, things like that. About 300 to 400 people every day come in the trailer. And uh, they, people call us street pastors, but um, even though it's considered a dangerous city, we feel relatively safe. Um, just recently, a fella in the trailer, I wasn't in the trailer, I was just up the, talking to somebody up the street, and a fella kind of, I won't say attacked my wife, but pretty close to it, and uh, within a, just an instant, three or four other fellas that were in there, just as bad as the guy that was attacking her, uh, jumped up to go to her rescue, so we were encouraged by that, that they seemed to appreciate you, and they are certainly happy to to defend us. Um, we pray that God would possibly some way send a couple to help, particularly a younger couple, but anybody, and uh, to come and help because it's just a lot of people, a lot of contact, and uh, a relatively open ear for the gospel. Um, when it comes to the measure of open ears. On Sundays at four o'clock, we have a supper and a service. We call it supper and uh, singing and service, we call it. And um, we get anywhere from a dozen to 20, 25 people into that meeting and simply preach the gospel at, the, uh, at that meeting. Over the, over the months in the last few years, there's been a number have professed to be saved, but it seems to me they all drag a little red wagon around, and uh, they got all their problems and their difficulties, and it's pretty hard, it seems to me, to empty the wagon. So there's difficulties in that sense to see that people established and going on in any measure. We try Bible studies, visiting in the homes, and things like that, but uh, that's where we stand presently. We ourselves fellowship in Taylor Side, which is about 45 or 50 minute drive from here. Two of the Christians from, well, all the Christians from Taylor Side are most supportive, but two of them, a retired brother and a sister, a mother, um, farm wife, Esther Forsyth and John Parker. They both come and help on the street when we are out with the trailer. So we're greatly blessed having their help. And we don't take that for granted by any means. We're very appreciative that they are being there. But in thinking about this verse about um, our walls being broken down, person without self-control is like a city that has walls broken down. I look around and I see that uh, amongst the people we work with, but sometimes I look into the mirror, maybe look into my own heart, and I wonder about my own walls. And I think it's not all bad, this being set aside with COVID. I think we've had time, maybe all of us, um, to pause and to look around and look within and to consider ourselves. Over the past weeks, I've been enjoying looking at the book of Nehemiah. And I'd like to read a few verses from Nehemiah, a number of verses, and give a few thoughts that I've been pondering uh, from the book of Nehemiah. We could read in chapter one of Nehemiah, and I'll begin at verse number one. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse number 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. I'm reading from the ESV. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from, Judea, from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped 
who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the, the God of heaven. Verse number 11. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. In chapter 2 and verse number 3, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in, his, in your sight, that you would send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. Verse number 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. And I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and turned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned. Verse number 18. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. And also the words that the king had spoken to me, and they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Then Elishab, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, a priest, and they built the sheep gate. And they consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zachar, the son of Imri, built. The sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts, and its, and its bars. The events in Nehemiah take place relatively late in the Old Testament history. Um, Israel and Judah, they no longer exist as nations. Um, the 70 year Babylonian um, exile has come to an end. Persia has conquered the Babylonian empire and the Persians were allowing the people of Israel to return back, the Jews to return back to their own country, to their own uh, place. And many of them returned with Jerubbabel and many went back with Ezra. Some suggest about 50,000 returned, but they also say that was two or three percent of the total number that had been originally <clears throat> taken captive. But in that city of Jerusalem, Ezra had rebuilt the temple, but the walls still lay in ruins. And it's a hundred years after Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed the walls, and for a hundred years, those walls have laid in ruins. I think we could say a hundred years is a, is a long time. The people have been back, 
the temple has been built and uh, they had made an attempt at building the walls, but it never got off the ground. And so there they were. And in Israel's day, a city's walls would have been visible for many miles. And it was a place of safety, a place of contentment, a place of comfort, a place where you could be relatively secure in that land, but a city without walls. My, the enemy could just walk in and they could simply um, walk into that place. And Hanani left Jerusalem. He seems to be the brother of Nehemiah and he travels down to Susa and he comes to the capital, to the city of Susa, and he finds his brother Nehemiah. Nehemiah, it would appear, has grown up in that land of Persia. It seems that he has never been to Jerusalem. It seems that he has done well in the country where he has been held captive for those many years. He's risen up to become cupbearer or wine bearer to the king, food taster, we might call it today. And there he is in that palace. And along comes Hanani. And I wonder if that evening when Hananiah came, if he wouldn't, they wouldn't sit down together. And like brothers do, they would talk. And they would talk late into the night. And in the conversation, Nehemiah says to Hanani, that uh, how are the people that survived the exile how are they doing, those that have come back to Jerusalem, back to Judea? How are they making out? I wonder if Hannah and I would sort of look down on the floor, says, well, it's a shame. It's a disgrace. They are not doing very well. The walls are broken down. Oh, the temple is there, but the walls are broken down and the, and the gates have been burned with fire. It's an absolute shame. It's a, a joke as far as the surrounding nations are concerned. And when Nehemiah heard those words, we read that he sat down. It would appear that he had no more strength. He was overwhelmed by sorrow and sadness. And Nehemiah, we're told, he wept and he prayed and he fasted and he mourned. And as he wept and prayed and fasted and mourned, he didn't do that just for a day or two. We read that it was for four long <clears throat> months that he continued in that distressed state of mind, praying to the God of heaven. And as he's there praying, back in Jerusalem, the people have become content. They're they're content with the way the walls are. They've walked past them so many times, they don't even see the rubble anymore. Something like my wife, she sometimes says, Steve, if, if I kept your, my, my kitchen the way you keep your garage, well, I wouldn't even be able to make a meal. But um, my garage is not that bad. But nevertheless, um, these people have been walking by the trash day by day and it's not even bothering them. And I, in reading that, have asked myself the question, is it possible, Steve, that you can be walking by the trash? Your walls are broken down. They are not what they ought to be. They're in a shambles. And it's not been like that for a while. It's been like that for a long, long time. And I wonder, how long it's been since I was like Nehemiah that I would sit down and weep and mourn and fast and pray to the God of heaven as I look at my walls. What are our walls? You know, a city with walls broken down is a man without a self-control is like a city that's got his walls broken down. Well, what are my, what are my walls, my spiritual walls? What are they? Well, 
I think we could say they're a thought life. And where do I go from there? I listened on the radio recently, some time ago, to a man. He was speaking about Solomon. He was speaking about Solomon and his wives and concubines, hundreds of them, hundreds of them. And he said, you know, we look at Solomon and we think, Solomon, how could you do that? How could it be possible? He said, what about in speaking to men and his, whoever they were in his audience? He said, what about us as men? What have we had in our minds? What thoughts? How many, how many times have we been like Solomon? Oh, we didn't have them physically. But the thoughts, and I wonder about sometimes about the thoughts in my mind, immoral thoughts, thoughts of bitterness, thoughts of unforgiving, unforgiving attitudes towards others, and my walls are broken down, and maybe they've been like that for a good long time, and I've never gone out to examine my walls. In this period of shutdown, I've been trying to examine my walls. And you know something? I'm afraid of the condition that my walls are in. But that's our thought life, our testimony before the world, before others, before those that we cross paths with, those that we, we meet. How am I when it comes to irritation? How am I when it comes to patience? How am I when it comes to my children and grandchildren? We have a family over to visit us trying to help them. And they've got three children. I put it mildly, the children have got a lot of room for improvement. My wife says, you know, maybe the Lord's using it to teach you a little bit of patience. And I wonder how is how am I managing when it comes to my Christian testimony before the world? My conscience, another wall. Is it based on the word of God? Is my conscience based on what people think, but what others do? And so I try and just go along with what they think or say or do. Is that my conscience based on that. But maybe another wall that I've been considering my own life, my character. I heard someone say one time that he felt that the best description of character is when you or I are allowed or taken or put. We have occasion to be in some far off city, New York or Boston or or. San Francisco or some place where nobody knows us, we're all by ourselves. Then how I behave, how I act, what I do, it'll be based on my character. My character to a great extent is based on my conscience. Is my conscience seared before God? Is it hardened? And is it softened in light of the word of God? So as we look at the walls, um, Nehemiah looked at the walls and he's broken down with sorrow as he examines, as he just considers the walls, as he thinks about them and the condition and the shame associated with it. How do I take and rebuild the walls? Well, Nehemiah, he wept, he mourned, he prayed, he fasted for four long months. And I ask myself, when have I truly known what it is to mourn over my sin? Blessed are those that mourn. We could say over our sin, they shall be comforted. And there's Nehemiah mourning. He doesn't point the finger at everybody else. He points the finger at himself. He says, we have sinned. I and my father's house have sinned. We have done corruptly. He takes and he puts himself 
in the very same thing, he begins to look at himself and he doesn't blame it on anybody else. He looks hard and fast at the difficulty and he puts himself into the same group. We, us, ours. He prays for opportunity to do something about it. He asks God to help him to do something about it. And I need to be praying and asking God, what can I do about the walls in my life? And the walls that are around, around my, my life. He comes before the king. It's interesting to me that Nehemiah has been a happy man because the king has never seen him sad. And when he comes before the king, the king says to him, why are you sad? Uh, you're not sick. This is nothing but sorrow and sadness of heart. And Nehemiah is afraid, possibly afraid that, that uh, Exactoras, or however I pronounce his, Artaxeras, however I pronounce his name, maybe um, Nehemiah is afraid that he'll think that he is devising some evil towards the king. But Nehemiah says, well, how can I not be sad? The city of my father's graves, the walls are broken down, and the gates are all burned with fire. And he says, how can I possibly not be sad? The king says to him with his, the queen sitting beside him, he says to him, uh, what are you requesting? What are you asking? What do you want? And Nehemiah prayed the God of heaven. There's 12 prayers mentioned in Nehemiah, spoken of, and this is the second one. Nehemiah prayed to the God of heaven. It must have been a short, quick prayer lifted to God. Uh, now you've given me the opportunity, O oh Lord, help me to present the situation before the king and soften his, his heart toward us, he prayed. And as he, as he presents to the king the the issue, and uh, he says to the king, send me. He doesn't say, let me go. He says, send me. He wants the king's involvement. As I've looked at that, I thought to myself of our Lord Jesus Christ, as in the glories of heaven, looking upon each of us, looking upon a broken and a busted world, looking on the shame and sorrow that is in this world, his heart, like Nehemiah, is moved with compassion. And as it were, he says to his father, send me. And the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. And he came all the way from the glory of heaven. The question is asked of Nehemiah, how long will you be? When will you return? Is it possible? That's the question faced by the Lord Jesus as he left the glories of heaven. How long are you going to be? And when will you return? They're all looking for his return. And the king is looking for the return of Nehemiah. He has got tremendous confidence in Nehemiah, appreciates Nehemiah. He's not wanting to lose him. He, lets, he allows him, he sends him down to Jerusalem. Not only sends him to Jerusalem, but he sends all the needed help he needs to get the project underway. He sends them letters to the governors that he can cross safely through the land. He sends letters to the keeper of the king's forest that he can have timber to repair the temple, the, the gates, the walls of the house and the city and the gates where he is going to be. And he not only does that, but he says, sends officers of the army, not just soldiers. He sends officers of the army with him and they travel from Susa all the way to Jerusalem, 900 miles, 1,400 kilometers. It must have been a, a long journey in those days. And finally, he arrives down in Susa, the cap in, in Jerusalem, and he finally gets to that city. When he gets there, he sits down for three days. When I first was looking at that, I thought to myself, he did nothing for three days. Oh, I, I don't think so. Nehemiah was given to prayer. He was given to thanksgiving. He was given to worship. 
And I judge he spent those three days before the Lord. The Lord doesn't lay everything out before us. His path all laid out before us, before uh, all at once. And Nehemiah has been sent to the city. He's received the letters. He's got the permission. He's going into the city. Now he sits down and he prays. He worships. He gives thanks to the God of heaven for all the way the Savior, as it were, has led him until this hour. And he's praying, Lord, Father, and God in heaven, what should I do now? And it comes into his heart and into his mind that he should go out at night. Interesting to my mind in chapter 2, we're told three times over that it was night when he went out. And I, I wonder, is that because a lot of times it's night when I, when I really do some thinking. I remember when the children were young, there's times I'd go into their bedroom and uh, look at them. They're sleeping in bed. And I think of the day, think of what I said, think of what, how I said it. Maybe not always said with grace, not always said with kindness and compassion. There's time to get down on my knees beside the children sleeping unconsciously in the bed and ask God to bless, give grace, and minister to our children, minister to, to the needs. And it's at night, the night hours. And Nehemiah goes out in those night hours and he goes and he goes out to the, to the, uh, to, to, to examine around. He tells nobody where he's going, and yet he took people with him. He took some men with him. Is that like the Lord Jesus when he went out to Gethsemane? He took the disciples with him, but he really, the disciples were unconscious, really, of what our Lord Jesus was going out there to accomplish. And Nehemiah goes out with those men. He's riding on a either a mule or a donkey or a horse, likely a donkey. Some would suggest they're a very sure-footed animal walking amongst the rubble. And they would, he goes out, he takes and he inspects. He's going to inspect the walls. That word inspect, if you look up in their Bible dictionary, is like the, is like the surgeon. When we come in there, we've got this problem, and he lays us on the operating table, and he opens us up, and he inspects. He very, very, you hope anyway, he very, very carefully inspects the incision the, where he's looking, what he's planning to do. So he does a great inspection. And Nehemiah is going to go out, and he's going to inspect the walls. He goes out through the valley gate. Some historians and archaeologi uh, archaeologists, they suggest that that is the same gate that our Lord Jesus Christ passed through on his way when he went out into the, into the valley and up into Gethsemane. Although there's no actual, I don't think there's any actual proof or evidence to prove that. But regardless, Nehemiah goes out by the, by the valley gate, the valley. Inspecting our walls, inspecting our life, and more yet, when I have sat down and said, Merle, tell me something. I'll just shut up. You just tell me. How can I improve? What am I doing wrong? Hardy yet, when I go to one of the brethren, brother I have confidence in, and say, brother, tell me something. I want some honest input. What am I handling wrong? How can I improve? What are my walls like? What is my life like? And as he goes out, he goes through the valley gate and it can be a depressing business. I've asked our girls when they were younger, particularly, sit down and write me a letter and tell me, just tell me what you're thinking what your thoughts are about me, about how I've handled things, what I've done. You know something? 
I've got a big file and not a big file. I've got a file in the, in the room. Some of those letters are in it. Sometimes it hurt. As we examine the walls, and I believe that every last one of us need to sit down. In this time when we're set aside, we need to sit down and examine the walls. And he inspected the he inspected the walls like a surgeon. He goes out through the valley, we say through the valley gate, but there was no gate. It's all burned with fire. It must have been a depressing, sad, soaring moment for him as he went out and goes through that burned down, burned down gate. And he inspects the walls. Then he goes a little farther. We read in chapter three, we find that the valley gate was 1,000 cubits from the dung gate. And Nehemiah goes on his donkey at least a great extent towards the dung gate. And finally, the rubble is so deep, he has to leave his animal, if it was a donkey or a horse, whatever it was, he has to leave his animal. Then he has to go on foot the rest of the, the way that he's going. And he comes to the dung gate. Well, what's dung gate? Well, if the valley gate is a valley of inspection, it's great that our Lord Jesus Christ down there is the lily of the valley. And it's a wonderful thing we find in the valleys. We find creeks and we find water oftentimes down in the valley. But nevertheless, it's a place of shadows, a place of darkness it can be. The dung gate. What's the dung gate? Well, the dung gate, you never brought anything in the dung gate. Everything went out. And yes, the gate was burned with fire as well. But that gate, everything went out that gate. Nothing came back into the city. It was for dung. It was for refuge, garbage, trash. Everything else that they threw down into the Kidron Valley and burned down there in the Kidron Valley. The dung gate. You know, you and I have things in our lives. Should I speak for myself? Things in my life. Things that need to go out the dung gate. Things that need to go out and not come back in. Let all bitterness, let all bitterness, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you and be put away from you with all malice. In Ephesians 4 and 31, there's things we're told in the word of God that need to be put away from us, put out of our life, out the dung gate. And we need a gate that is going to be put up to keep the stuff from coming back in. Because how easy it is to go out and pick through the garbage and uh, bring stuff back in. But then finally, he leaves the dung gate. And if you look on the map, of the Jerusalem, the old walls of Jerusalem, which you can see the maps and maybe in the back of your Bible or in, in uh, um, commentaries or books. It shows that the, that the fountain gate is on near the bottom of the city, a thousand cubits from, the, from that uh, dung gate. But the nice thing is the fountain gate is real close to the dung gate, just a few, we might say yards apart, they're close together. And what is the fountain gate? Well, after we've been in the valley, we've been inspecting the walls, we've seen the sad condition in the valley gate, we've come to the dung gate, and that which is, should be put out of our lives is put out by the grace of God, and the help of the Holy Spirit, because we can't do it on our own, and it's put out. Then we come to the fountain gate. If ever there was a gate that is a picture of the Holy Spirit, if any man thirst, the Lord Jesus said, let him come unto me and drink. And we come to the fountain gate, and there we find refreshment. Lord Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. And we come to that fountain gate, a place of refreshment a place where we were strengthened and Nehemiah certainly recognized his tremendous need. And then Nehemiah, it says, he turned and he went back. And he went back to the valley 
gate and he enters and he goes into the city again and doesn't tell us when but possibly the next day or very shortly hereafter he goes to the to the jewish people he goes to the officials and to the priest and the nobles and he goes to them all and he sits down before them and he says we are in great trouble we have got great problems great shame we we not you we He's never even been there before. He wasn't responsible for the breaking down of the walls, but he puts it, we. But he tells them of the good hand of God that has been upon him. And he tells them about Susa in the capital. He tells them about King Artaxerus, how King Artaxerus has responded and sent him down here to the city. And he shows them the letters. He lays it all up before them. And he said, we need to rise up and build. And those people that day, God blessed them. They all agreed with them. And with one tremendous, total, complete, unanimous decision, they rose up and they rose up to build. With a purpose of heart and a determination, we are going to build. And they rose up to build. But as you rise up to build, there is Sanballat, and there is Tobiah, and they are standing in their way. And you can read about all the opposition that Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs gave in trying to hinder building up the walls. And you know, we are in the same condition, we might say. All the Sanballats and all the Tobias, they're not all dead yet. Uh, there's lots of them around the world flesh, the dev devil certainly stand in our way, and there's tremendous opposition standing in our way because of the flesh and the world and the devil. But Nehemiah and those people were determined by the grace and help of God, and that wall was built and finished in 52 days. And even the enemies had to look on and they had to say, you know, the hand of God has been in this. It's been the hand of God that, is, that has done this. They started, we read in chapter 3, they started there uh, at the Sheep Gate. That's where you and I are going to get our start. First in salvation was at the Sheep Gate. It was when we came to appreciate the work of Christ, when we came to appreciate and understand and put value and it was revealed to us by the Holy Spirit that Christ died for our sins and he met our need at Calvary and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. Now we can move on and day by day, we need to go back to the sheep gate. And it's interesting to me that the sheep gate is the only gate that no bars and no locks are mentioned because the sheep gate's always open and it's open at all the time to go and find strength and and help at the at the sheep gate and it's the only gate that is mentioned that was sanctified and those at that sheep gate they worked they worked diligently and they worked hard and they built the wall and they built the sheep gate and they put the gates back up and they put those gates hanging and swinging and then the next gate they began to work on was the fish gate there's 10 gates that are mentioned in chapter 3. There's 12 gates altogether in Jerusalem. The other two gates are also mentioned in the book, but there's just 10 gates that are mentioned in chapter 10 of the work that the uh, people did in working on those gates. There's just the 10 of them mentioned. But the first gate was the sheep gate. The second gate that is mentioned was the sheep gate. And when we come to put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, the Lord Jesus says to every one of us, he says to his disciples, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. And I might ask ourselves, how's the fishing business? How's it going? How are we doing? How is our testimony in the world? Maybe first of all, how's my testimony before my own wife and children and family in the home? The assembly will never be any stronger than what the home is. And how is my testimony there in the world? What is it like 
Do my family, my friends, my neighbors, the people up the street, the people I work with, do they recognize that I have been with the Lord? Do they see something in me that is different than all the people that are round about? I read a survey some time ago that said, if it can be believed, although I looked up and other surveys suggest the same thing, that 98%, that's 98%, of Christians, it didn't say professing Christians, it just said Christians, 98% of them do not bear witness to their faith with family, friends, neighbors, workmates. Wow. We look around and we see the world increasingly, alarmingly getting dark in an alarming fashion quickly. And uh, I think, well, it's so dark. I wonder why. Well, darkness, we learned in school, was an absence of light. And I wonder if every one of us as Christians um, allowed our light so to shine in this world, it'd be a great, maybe there'd be more light in the world. Wouldn't be so dark in North America. Maybe it would change some things. I know we're in the last days. I know Jesus is coming back. We profess to believe that. But nevertheless, if we were all diligently seeking as God enables us, and I know everybody's not a preacher of the gospel or anything like that, but if we were just able to let our light so shine before men. I like what a brother used to pray uh, Reynolds Jensen, his name was, and he said, Lord, help us to take the bushels off our, off our candles because we're prone to putting our light under a bushel. And I read as well that if you have a little candle, you put it out in a pitch dark night, that that candle can be seen for 50 kilometers. Now that's a long way. And if it can be seen such a long distance, most of us are pretty dim bulbs. And maybe if we just let our light so shine in such a small little way, then we would certainly have light in this world. In the years that I have lived, 70, 76 of them, in all those years, I've only had two people who didn't know me come and talk to me in conversation asking me, bringing the gospel before me, bringing salvation before me, not knowing that I was a Christian. And the first time was well over 50 years ago, maybe 54 or five years ago, unloading a truck in Simcoe, Ontario, throwing stuff off the truck to a guy that was catching it on the ground. And he stopped on that hot day and he wiped the sweat off his brow. And he says, hey, sir, I wanna ask you something. I said, oh yeah, what? He said, are you saved? It was Paul Fletcher. He met at the, at the Simcoe Bible Chapel in Simcoe, Ontario. But Paul asked me, but in all the years until just a few weeks ago, I was in getting a part for the lawnmower. And uh, the fella selling the parts, he says to me, you know, he says, we got a lot of troubles in the world, eh? Not only with COVID and the virus and all this stuff, but there's troubles everywhere you look. And he says, isn't it a great thing, you know, a person can have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he started to tell me how he had trusted Christ as Savior. And he started to tell me about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that maybe of only two people in all those years, possibly that's a suggestion to us that the, that the, um, that the survey wasn't so far out that 98% of us don't say very much. So God bless us and uh, um, help us that we might look at our walls and consider it. And there's um, eight more walls that I didn't mention, but in the book of, in the third chapter here of Nehemiah. And I think all of them are a tremendous example to us. I uh, have a story to tell each one of them of our life, our walls, our gates to build them up, stand firm in the dark world 
under temptation and opposition, we might stand firmly before the Lord. Last God's blessing, we pray. Our Father, we give thanks to you for the goodness of the Lord showered upon us, mercies from above. We're thankful, our Father, that we have ever, by the grace of God, been brought into the family of God and been linked eternally with the living God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, how blessed we are. Thank you, Father, for your people. How poor we would be without them. Thank you, our Father, for everyone that is um, saved by your grace and just seeking in our little way to live our lives to bring honor and glory to the name and person.